Yeah, good evening, everyone. Tonight, we'll continue with uh, techniques in business analysis. And uh, we're starting tonight with um, risk management using red log. We've discussed this thing in project management, but it's still a requirement in business analysis. It's very important in business analysis because the moment you start meeting with your stakeholders, that's when you start expecting risk. As a business analyst, you have an appointment, your stakeholder is not turning up, and you have a timeline. These are risks. So that's why it's important that you as a business analyst, you have to document your own risk and know how to navigate your risk. Even though there is a project manager, but you have to protect yourself. You have to capture your risk. And uh, this will help you to, to be prompt um, with your deliverables. Red log is one of the um, the popular method of capturing risk and other project um, variables. You can use it to capture risk. You can use it to capture capture assumptions, issues, and dependencies and uh, properly log them. Is a project management tool used to store several project information in one place. So we capture all these, when you capture risk assumptions, issues and uh, dependencies, you've almost captured everything that is very important within the project. So what are the risks we capture in um, red? These are something that will have a negative impact on the project if it happens and can lead to quality delay or cost problems. When there is a risk, <laughs> there is a possibility your project can be delayed. And when the project is delayed, it's affecting your timeline and it's affecting the cost. So you need to capture such things in your read and um, assign someone to manage it within the project team or you manage it yourself using your risk uh, management plan. Why read is important is that when you capture something on read, because you, you have step three meetings on read, you always have read meeting on weekly basis. So you always look at your, all the risks that are opened. And whenever you see that the risk, risk is open, you have to work hard to close it. So any risk that you've not uh, addressed cannot be closed in red. So whenever you, you, you manage a risk and address the risk, then you close it. When, there is, when the risk is no more, you close it. And that's how you use it for assumption as well. Assumption are those factors that are taken for granted but cannot be guaranteed and may impact 
the result of the project. So such things, you might, uh, you know that it's there, but you can, you can take it for granted, but in project management, you don't take, you don't take anything for granted. Issues, uh, incidents that cause projects to become out of alignment is a risk that have already happened. Is an issue. So you capture it in red and address it. When um, your project is, um, when you've, uh, you, you are supposed to deliver a project in three months, and three months have elapsed and you've not delivered the project, that is an issue. But when you have, you have, you have projects, looking at your deliverables, you can see that you have, um, you, you cannot finish this project in, um, in one month. And within your, your timeline, you only have uh, two weeks, so that is a risk. But when it has happened, it's now an issue. And you document all these things in red, and then you manage them. You must develop a risk um, management uh, strategy that you use to address such things like whether the risk need to be owned, transferred, or other methods. So whichever strategy you have, you need to address them and you cannot close it on RAID. So RAID is like a monitor for you. Once you open your RAID, you know the how healthy your project is. If it's not healthy, you know that you are in trouble. Dependencies are those activities that need to start or be completed in order for the project to proceed to the next level. So if um, you have dependencies that you need to do, um, uh, uh, task A before doing task B. Then these are dependencies. You cannot start task B until you finish task A. And when task A is delayed, task B is delayed as well. So that's how you have a, a chain reaction when you are having a pro, uh, projects um, the, um, deliverables that are dependent on each other. And most of the time these happen in, in waterfall methodology because most of the activities in waterfall are sequential. You have to do the first one before you do the second. You have to count one before you count two. And you cannot count two until you finish counting one. Unlike uh, in agile methodology, you can start number one and move and start number 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 three. As long as you feel that um, is 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 okay by you. So that's why agile is a, is a flexible approach. Why do we keep red? Red help us to keep track. Keep your projects organized and on track. 
make the information easier for you to retrieve. You can once you look at it, you information you you really got a very nice dashboard that will help you to just look, have a glance on your project dashboard and you know how your project is looking. The useful document, a regular meeting and audit. So it helps you to audit your project regularly. Gives confidence that the project is under control because you, you, you have regular meeting, you document everything that happened, you have a glance, you see how everything is working. A good how to manage read is that um, first you need to um, capture everything by categories. Then you describe them. Then you prioritize them and uh, state their status. When you are categorizing them, you categorize whether the, the problem you are capturing or the whatever the item or the incidents you are capturing, whether it's an issue under the category, whether it's a, an assumption, whether it's a risk, So you capture them in that format and whichever one you capture, you describe what is happening within that uh, item that you captured. And you give it a priority. Giving it priority means stating the impact. Is it high or is it low? Or is it negligible or is it moderate or critical? So that's how you prioritize the, the incident you captured to indicate the impact on your project. And you stay the status. You keep it open until you resolve it. So when you come to your read and you see that you are read, everything is closed, then you know you are you are working hard because you're working hard to resolve all your all the problems as well that's coming up within the project. But when you come and everything is open, you should ask yourself a question, what's happening? Even um, if there is a, an, um, a line manager trying to audit your work, see what you are doing and they come to see a world and everything is open, they will not be happy. So it, it help you to know the status or the, the how healthy your project is. And when everything is um, closed, you find out that everything will be in green. But when everything is open, you find out that all your, everything will be in red, means your, your project is full of hazards, so, so much risk within your, your, your project. Your project is not healthy. So this is how a read dashboard looks like. When you, you come to your dashboard and you see that everything is red, everything is red, means there is probably everything is critical, 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 and they are all open. Then you know that um, you, you've got some work to do. So this is the dashboard. Once we keep on feeding your dashboard, it will start appearing here. So you know the, the amount of critical if it's risk you have, the amount of critical assumption you have, the amount of critical issues and dependencies, and the total um, number of risk you have, total number of issues 
And that's how you do these things and everything will, will work out, start working out fine. You, 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 you find out that you become in charge of your project. You can only be in charge of your project when you have the right documentation. But if you, if you don't have the right documentation, you always be panicking. But when you see that you, everything is documented, you are managing it, even the auditors come, you can, you can, you can confidently defend your project. So this is the, the red log itself. So if you are going, the red log we are going to be using, this is how it's going to be looking like. So under red categories, like I say, you need to categorize it. You see the issue here, you see assumption, you see risk, everything captured. And the description, the impact, you state the impact and uh, you need to assign owner, someone within the project team to manage uh, the incident you've captured, whether it is whichever one, it must have an owner. So that somebody can be responsible for it. Everybody cannot, uh, everybody, can manage as a team, but someone must own own any uh, own it as a as as a duty to address it, to monitor it, and when there is a meeting, the person that owns the risk is the person that we speak for the risk. How uh, he has been trying to address the risk, the challenges he be having trying to address the risk. And if needed, if, if the person needs assistance, the kind of assistance, and if it means that the risk needs to be escalated to the next level, the person will. So that is how you do it. And it's always very good to have a timeline to manage any, any risk. So if the risk, for instance, that's why some of these softwares, if you're using softwares like um, ServiceNow to capture your incidents, whenever you are logging a risk or whatever or incidents, you must give that incidents a timeline, must have a timeline. You can't just um, log it up and leave it there was a timeline. So after that timeline, automatically the, the, the risk, if you cannot close that, that risk before the due date, automatically the risk will trigger to the next um, line management. It will escalate itself to the line management. So even if you are, you as a junior officer is trying to cover something. There's no way you can cover something because it's programmed that way. So that once it triggers, the, the line manager or the higher authority will know that there is a problem because you find out that some junior officers, they will be, they, they have a, a, a risk they are managing and out of fear, they will not disclose that they cannot manage the risk anymore. They will just be hiding. And before you know it, it will trigger to something that will cause a very serious damage to the organization. So in a situation, for instance, you are using service now to manage your risk, it will automatically trigger to the next um, support line. So that's how it's escalate, and that's why that particular software is very popular. Although it's very it's costly, but so many big big companies are using it. But that is out of our scope for now. The main thing is for us to understand how to use basic um, risk management techniques.
to address our problems or manage our risks. So very soon we'll start using it and uh, it's very simple to use. And that's it about uh, using rates to address our problem. Just once you understand this, it's okay for now. There are so many, so many more sophisticated ways, softwares, but some of them once will get confused if you, if you go so uh, advanced at this point. Then here we are in, um, we are back in um, requirement elicitation technique. Interview is the most, we've treated this earlier, but under techniques, it's featured again because interview is a very powerful technique in project management. As a business analyst, you must be bold enough to be having a lot of interviews. So it's not something you can um, you can run away from. So the, the earlier you start practicing, the better. So you must know how to run an effective uh, workshop. There is um, something that happened. Is uh, a business analyst. The guy just um, secured a very good job, you know, and that's the first time of running an interview or running a workshop. This is a full workshop, not just a one-on-one -on -one interview. And all the attendees have gathered. This is not um, uh, a Zoom interview. This is a live interview where you people, the, the, the stakeholders who attend the interview, the, the workshop, then you conduct the workshop um, and asking questions and the getting um, responses. But the young man was so nervous and when everybody gathered, he, he didn't know what to do and um, went to the toilet, he excused himself, but coming back from there, he went and uh, took his bag and ran away. Because um, he was very nervous. He couldn't address the crowd. So, and that's so embarrassing. And what happened is because the young man didn't plan very well. If you if you plan very well, then such a situation will not arise. So how do we plan to make sure that we don't find ourselves in such a situation? We've uh, done this. I've um, we've discussed this particular but we'll, we'll, we'll discuss it again. So to conduct an interview or a workshop, the first thing you do is to identify the, um, for first you need to define the purpose of the interview, know why you are, um, Conducting that interview, so that is a purpose. You know what you are conducting the interview for. Then when you know the purpose, the subject matter for the interview, then you need to identify the people that uh, such matter, uh, because not everybody within your project um, 
we attend some interviews, it depends on the one that is affecting them. You can't just, uh, because it's a stakeholder within your project, you, you start inviting them on your workshop and they don't have anything to contribute. So when you have a purpose, identify the target uh, respondent and uh, start inviting them. You prepare a list prior the interview. Decide the type of interview you will use, whether uh, it's going to be a note taking, whether you are going to be recording it, whether you are going to hire someone to be taking note for you, you are going to use questionnaire or form, whichever way. You must decide which one to use. Then contact the respondent before the interview to make sure that they are free to attend the workshop or the interview. Once you've agreed a date with your respondent, then do a, a pilot interview to refine the question and the interview process. On the date of interview, conduct the interview on the dates and the time and you need to be at least five minutes before the interview time, making sure that you are not late. It's going to be embarrassing if you are the one that um, you are the one that is uh, conducting the interview and you attend late. That's why you see, uh, since I started with you guys, I've never been late for one day. Never. If I'm going to be late, I'm not saying that it cannot happen. There's what we call a uh, unforeseen circumstances, which I don't I pray for it to come. But if I find myself in a situation, maybe I'm coming back from work and there is a hold up. And I find out that before getting home and um, that I'll be late, I'll send a message to the group that look at the situation, I might be late or I'll cancel the, the, the workshop or the class. But if I'm the one hosting and I'm late, that is embarrassing. No matter how you look at it. And I've developed that culture that I can't be late. So if I'm going to be late, I need to take an excuse. I need to call to say, look, look, this is, I have a situation. And that is me not being late because I've addressed the issue beforehand. So that's how you should do if you are the one hosting, because you find out very soon as a, as a business analyst, you are going to be hosting a lot of meetings. So let the question uh structure the conversation but adapt to the discussion as needed take note or record the interview in order to capture the conversation listen don't interrupt make the participant feel comfortable and be respectful of boundaries so being respectful of boundaries is very, very important. Some people tend to um, trying to be jovial or you try to crack a joke just. But even if you are, are trying to, to, to use an icebreaker, just know the kind of icebreaker you're using or try to be um, moderate. Before completing, ask the respondents for additional input or comment so that they can be original to give us some things you didn't capture in your question. Take notes. Uh, take time to document important ideas and findings soon 
after completing the interview. You are, you are, you are, you are completing that um, interview because you want to pick some points that will help you. So don't just, after the interview, you, you start um, maybe hanging out or chatting or discussing or that thing like that inter the, the workshop is over. Don't do that because you might forget some important things within the interview. So all, because you recorded it, yeah, it's good, but it's still good that you proceed to documentation immediately. And soon after you've completed, you, you finish your documentation, send it across back to the uh, stakeholders that attended their interview for them to validate, making sure that the uh, record is, um, yeah, your record doesn't have any error. If there is any error, there's, that is the opportunity for you to correct them before you proceed to um, data analysis. So that's how you conduct uh, an effective interview. It's very simple. Just take it that you, uh, you, are, you are there for chatting, you're there for discussion, and you find out that it's very, very, you are not going to struggle once you understand it. But if you didn't plan, if you, if you didn't um, do a, a pilot interview, didn't capture your question, the question you are going to ask him is going to be, embarrassing it might sound simple but when you start now you find out that uh, it's, it's not it's not simple because some of you will make it not to be simple a class before you i've taught them about this interview or workshop this particular um techniques I've gone through this over and over and over. And when it's time for them to, to gather requirements for me that I've been <clears throat> teaching them, it's not just it's not even um, an outside st stakeholder in our workplace means here. Yeah just for them to gather requirement from me use this approach that i've taught them they couldn't do it as a group and that was so embarrassing how can you after being here in a class uh, i taught this so many times like this is the second time i'm repeating this but they find out that for them to just collect data from me we're not talking about outside stakeholder. This is just within us here in our training and in our uh, work placement. They couldn't do it. Some of them were, were nervous, you know? And that's not funny. Because most of the time, once we come for this um, live class, everybody will be will close their camera when you are going to capture your interview you are not going to close your camera i made all of them to open the i want that told them that during the work, work, um, workshop if you're gathering requirement from me you need to open your camera i need to see your face but i found out that some of them couldn't do it they were nervous so it could, it doesn't look so simple if, if you are not uh, used to it. If you don't practice, it's going to happen to you. So you need to start practicing how to do it. Survey or questionnaire, basic rules while writing your 
questionnaire. Well, avoid making assumptions about respondents. Use short questionnaires. Long questionnaires will result in decreased participation. For instance, you want to capture um, capture your data through survey or questionnaire, not a true one-on-one um, -on -one interview. Once you have long uh, questionnaire, people might not um, be interested. So you try as much as you can to make it short and straightforward and straight to the point. Use clear, use clear, easily understandable wording for all educational level. So make it, no matter the level of your, your education that people can, everybody can just um, participate. Especially if you are doing it online or using like, um, let me say, uh, social media, we, we want to capture survey about an event or activity or a situation where a lot of people need to participate, whether educated or not educated, use very clear language that a lot of people will, uh, don't be so, don't use, um, complex uh, vocabularies. Use positive statement and avoid asking emotional questions. Emotional question is just like you during an interview, try to probe into somebody's um, um, privacy. You must respect privacy if you know that people will respond to your questions. Question should not be biased or leading to participant towards an answer. Once you are you are you are using a biased question, it means you have something you you already know the answer you want to get, and that doesn't make your your questionnaire viable because you already know what you wanted. Then why are you asking? Remember to include contextual questions. Contextual questions are questions that uh, allow the questionnaire, I mean the, the respondent to make original inputs. For instance, other questions can be um, choice-based question using options like yes or no, false or but when you use con contextual questions, it means that you, you give the person the opportunity to make um, a natural and original input. Avoid questions more than one time per item. End the questionnaire in an open-ended question, such as, is there anything else you like to say? That's allowing them to make um, comments or tell you what you want, they, 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 are, they, are, they feel that you should know that you didn't capture. With this, you should be able to come up with a very viable questionnaire and uh, viable data that will help you to solve your problem. Now we're going to look at um, process analysis. Process analysis an analyzes a process for its efficiency and effectiveness 
as well as his ability to identify opportunity for change. Mainly when we do process analysis is when we are evaluating a process to look at how we can improve on that process uh, to help us use that process to explore more opportunities. Over time, a process gets old. A process gets outdated, obsolete. We find out that a process is no longer viable, is no longer serving its purpose. Then you know that it's time to improve on that process. And when you are improving on the process, you must have to look out for something. You have to look out for a gap within that process that making that process to no longer be effective. And when you identify the gap in the process, then you improve on the process by filling the gap. So the gap can be you, you remove part of the process or you add more things within the process to boost the process. It can be either we can be addition or subtraction. That's mainly how to improve on the process using is a combination of you identify the gap. If you are using lean methodology, then you are most of the time looking for waste within the process so that you can fish out the waste and then optimize the process. Or if you can use Six Sigma to keep on adding value, call it continuous improvement on the process. Can keep on adding more value within the process. It's not only removing the, the waste. Waste removal is not the only way to improve on process. You can add more things in the process, even without removing anything within the process. So understanding factors to be included in a contract negotiation is one of the major things. Understanding how data and technology are used in a process, these are ways you can um, uh, improve on a process. Analyzing the impact of a pending change on a process. And most of the time you use Lean and Six Sigma. So we are going to um, analyze a lot of processes. And in uh, business an analysis, most of the things we are going to be doing as a business an analyst is working on processes. I can tell you that 60% um, of your work as a business analyst is going to be working on processes, improving on processes. And if you understand the technique very well, it's going to be fun. So it's, 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 it's just trying to understand the gap between the current process and the future process. The future process is what you want to achieve, more especially if a process is having a problem. So you need to do a lot of analysis within a process. And that's what you are going to be doing. So that's where most of our activities will be coming as an analyst. So here we'll describe the, the contents of the solution or part of the solution. 
that's how when we are trying to do a process modeling, we need to describe what actually happened or the desired to happen during a process. Provide an understandable description of a sequence of activity within a process. So if there is a process we are working on, we must understand how everything happened in that process. For instance, if you go to work every day using a particular route, and you find out that you are now going to work late most of the time. And it means that that process you take to go to work is no longer working. So you need to find a means to improve on the process through which you go to work. But you need to understand how you go to work how we going to work and it's not working before you can think of a better solution. So you must understand when you are going to work, why are you having issues? So that you know that like some of you that uh, lives in Lagos, maybe if you are going from um, RGG to VI, and when you get to um, Todman Land Bridge, is that where your problem starts? Is that the, the hold up within the Todman Land Bridge? Is that your, where you have issue? You must identify, if it's a hold up, you must identify where the hold up starts. You see, when you get to uh, Ojota, you see, when you get to Ogudu, or where, where does that hold up start? When you must know where the hold up starts and when the hold up starts. So you, you know how to improve on your process going to work. This is you as a, as, a, as a business analyst analyzing how to improve on this process. If most of the time the, the, the hold up starts by by seven o'clock, there, there are so many ways you can do that. When you get to, if the hold up start by, eight, by seven o'clock at Ogudu, then you must find a way to bypass Ogudu at that point in time to avoid that hold up. If, if the hold up start by seven o'clock, then another way is for you to make sure that by six o'clock you've passed that area and then you bypass the hold up. So that's how you improve on a process. You must have a sequence, no, and then so that you should be able to identify where the issue starts. So this will take us to this. Um, case study we've looked at before, which is um, the process of um, managing uh, a faulty boiler within a real estate company. We've done this. This is where I use this um, case study for us to understand how business analysis works. So this is the problems this organization will be having. And if they don't address this, order, this uh, particular problem, they are going to lose their customers. 
So their customers will probably start looking for more viable housing agents that will help them solve their problems. So now they look at the, the way the company have been managing to resolve their issues when customers have issues relating to housing estate. They identify the incidents, log uh, the incidents, the customer call, the help desk, the help desk, then um, receive and log the incidents and then call the landlord. A landlord review and give approval and then report back to help desk. And then the help desk then call the technician to go and fix the te technician. We then do site visitation and after site visitation, go back to the store, pick spare parts and go back and fix the, the, the faulty boiler and then conduct a text, complete the, uh, send back to the help desk to complete paperwork and then prepare a message, then call the customer which is the, the tenant to confirm that the issue has been resolved. And that's where the, this particular process, and but this process is faulty. So they need to find a way to address the issue. But they should be able to, um, their business analyst should, um, is a very clever one because the business analyst happen to document the activities very well. And if, if these activities are not documented very well, it's going to be difficult. So that's when I say you must know the sequence and then you know where you come in. If you don't have the sequence, you don't know even whether you are starting from the last activity or even from the second or the third, that's how you document it. And most of the time, which is something we are going to review in this uh, sequence, when we are capturing um, activity, because this is, we are trying to look at how to reduce the time. We must add time is going to take us to take to handle a process. Like for instance, the customer calling the, the, the help desk must have how long it take, maybe 10 minutes, then receiving the call, maybe um, another 10 minutes, then sending a, a, an email to the landlord and take like one day to add the duration so that when we are fixing, we know how much time we are saving. So now we've identified the sequence, we we'll do a gap analysis. And from our gap analysis, you find out that what we are going to be fixing here is um, removing the waste. We need to remove our activities with our landlord when it comes to house maintenance. We are going to take the responsibility of maintaining the house on behalf of the landlord because landlord's involvement can be um, taking our time. After all, landlord has given us uh, power to handle and manage the property. So they, they shouldn't be uh, coming to review or uh, approve or not approve whether to, main, to maintain a house. So once you rem remove these three activities within this supply chain, we we'll find out that we are saving reasonable time. 
and this time saved can be used to attend to other customers. And this will bring out, bring down the backlog we are, have, we are having within our company. So when this is sorted out, we'll have a new, a new way, which is to be, this is the target state, what we are trying to achieve to reduce waste. So you can use this approach in so many processes. This is just an um, illustration. You can uh, use it, apply it in so many ways, whether you are where you are working uh, in your office or anywhere, or even if you get a new job, this is an effective way of of handling or, or working in a process. So that's what we call process modeling or process, call it process map or process modeling. These are, other ways of process mapping. It's almost the same thing with the first one. But this is another way we can, um, we can do our process modeling. This is how to check out in a hotel, the process of checking out in a hotel. And you see the sequence of activity. You can use it to improve within the hotel on how to check out and see where you are having issues and then improve on that. Looking at this flow, First, greet the guests and ask about the stay. Then, check the guest balance. How much is the, the person owing them? Prepare invoice for the guests. Then, next, collect payment. Then, hand over invoice copy. Then, request guests to fill out. Statif uh, satisfaction survey, then thank the guests and then update the status. So this is a, a simple process analysis. And then here you can see within this time range, you see the time it takes to check balance and prepare the invoices within half a minute to 1.5 minutes. So, so this is the time. So if you are preparing for your addition, you can use this format. You capture the time hit time in here. Then looking at request for um, request to fill out satisfactory stat survey. You look at the time, two to four minutes. That's what it takes to do that. So you can add more time it takes to do all this, thing, and then you know how long it takes to complete this process. And if this process is taking too much time, then you look at which one you are going to uh, remove within this process. So if, so if it's taking too much time, so you, when you are trying to check and there is so many customers queuing up, trying to check out, you might as well remove this uh, feeling, the satisfactory survey at this moment, because this is the only one that, although it's very good to gather feedback, which is very important in 
agile methodology. So, but it's left for you to check within these processes which out of these processes is less valuable to the system, more especially the problem you are trying to solve. Because you need to check the balance, which is money. You need to prepare an invoice. You need to collect the money. You need to hand the invoice. And you need to say thank you. And of this, so out of all these, this is still um, when you are trying to um, add the, um, the priority, this is, is, I don't think this is a must in a critical situation where there are so many customers grumbling waiting for you. So that's how you manage a process and resolve an issue within the process as a business analyst. So I, I will not treat this one today. So I will just stop in this process analysis, process analysis. So that's next time. So somebody asked a question, how about automating the system? Automating the system is, um, first you need to identify the process that you need to, to automate. It's still part of the process analysis. When you're automating, you must know what you are automating. But there is some um, processes you cannot automate. Some process you can automate, but some processes you cannot automate. So I don't see how you can automate this particular process. Tell me how you can automate this process. Is it um, um, receiving call from the from the from the uh, uh, customer? Or is it when after receiving call, when you try to send an email to the landlord? Even if you are sending an email to the landlord, the, the, the landlord must read the email. So when you're automating a process, is some processes mainly like data collection and the within some that don't need um That you feel that machine can be um, can 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 take care of that, but not every process that you can automate. But you can still do automation. That can be done, but you, you need to identify the process you are automating to know whether it's automatable. So if you identify a process and is automatable, then you automate the process. They are all ways of um, solving um, issues. Most of the activities here is all of automation. Like most of the activities I'm handling now, they are all automation. But the main thing is for us to understand this understand the gap within the process, and then we we'll find out how to solve the problem. Automation is one of them. Yeah. 
Do you have any more questions? I would prefer in a situation where you, when you have a question, you, you talk so that everybody will hear your input. Yes, you made a very good point as like um, these five invoice can be automated. If the, the guests have got an email, so it can be triggered to the email or maybe through the phone. But it depends if you have the, the capacity to do that. Or if Mainly if the, the, they are using like a um, bank card to make payments, that can be triggered through the email. So do you have any more questions? So thank you, Amarachi Stanley for at least making an input to show that at least we are understanding what we are doing here. Amarachi, I, will, I say thank you. I want to hear from you. You've made a, you made a valuable input. Thank you, Charles. Yeah. What do you know about um, automation? Okay, no, I just mentioned, um, I looked at the process actually, and I felt that some things can be eliminated from the process. And um, if you automate some processes, um, it will make some, it will reduce the time people spend because you're trying to review a business process. You are trying to create efficiency within a system. So if you're able to reduce the amount of time people spend within the environment, then you're able to create a, a better process. So looking at that particular hotel checkout process, you could find a couple of things that you don't really need to interface with the individual that he can receive in his emails and all that. So that's how I looked at it. I don't really have a process, an automation process. Yeah. Yeah. Most mostly in business analysis. Um, these days, uh, ways of uh, reducing time, not only reducing time, but increasing um, efficiency, mainly in data management to reduce error, is a uh, true automation. So that's what um, mainly the, like the, the project I'm handling now is uh, trying to integrate two companies. So like my company just bought a new company, my company acquired another company 
So they want to integrate the two companies together. They don't want, they still want to leave the company they bought to become their subsidiary. So, but they want to be seeing what is going on within the other company so that any activity happen there, they will know what's going on. So the only way is then integrating the two companies and then automate most of the financial transaction so that as they are having a transaction in company, the small company, the big company will automatically be getting more especially invoices into their own bigger accounts. And this is done through automation. It's going to reduce fraud. It's going to reduce um, error in handling all those, um, some of the invoices. So these invoices is no longer going to be through um, a paper invoice and it's not going to just be uh, through um, uh, this um, PDF. It's going to be XMLs, XML data that can be transmitted very fast and very efficiently without error and is readable. So this is how, and if they should be doing this manually, it's going to cost a lot of money. They are going to employ like two or three full time, uh, full -time staff that will be handling that uh, financial and debt operation. And still those people will still be making mistakes. But once this, activity is um, integrated and automated, there will be no error. And the issue of hiring more workers will be there. So they will be saving a lot of money through the integration and the automation. So you made a very viable point. So, um, We'll be looking at um, having a assignment within process, but I cannot give the assignment now until I teach you people how to use uh, this uh, UML, um, how to use it before I can give the assignment because there's Like I wanted to, maybe tomorrow we have to quickly rush and do it so that you people can start the assignments and continue. I wanted you guys to learn how to use this particular um, tool, draw.io, which I might be sending, um, I might be sending a YouTube video for you people to watch before we have a class on that so that you understand it and um, visio or uh, lucid charts and um, Miro. These three softwares are the major softwares we are going to be using as a business analyst. They serve the same purpose. So if you, this particular draw.io is free, completely free. Then this video is a product of Microsoft. But this video, this draw.io is a clone of this uh, video. So you're getting everything in this video for free in this draw.io, which is uh, free. It's an open source. This um, group of developers came together to develop it and make it free. So, and Lucid Charts is a product of Google. It's a clone of um, this video as well. And this one is serving the same purpose. It's more intuitive 
than others, but they all of them serving the same purpose. So we have to learn how to use, I'll encourage you people to start learning how to use this because only if you have this, you know, if you have this one, good and fine, you can use it. But because I know it's not free, you know, a free software. So you use either this one or use either this one. This one have limitations as well. I think you have three projects already. It will prompt you to pay. But you've got, you can use free. This one will got some free mode and uh, paid mode. But this one is completely free. I use it a lot, even in all give me USD. I use this in the office. When I was trying to do quick um, and my video was a bit of, uh, I don't know what, I just quickly jump into this one and uh, do my process map to support my analysis. So I will be sending a link for you to watch. You know, there's so many good videos you can watch about this all these things in uh, YouTube. So when you watch it, so that the next time we, I'll be coming, I will don't have to start mapping it. What we'll be doing is mainly review. That's what we're going to be doing. I'll share the link um, in the in our group charts. So this is how the interface uh, looks. This is so this is how where I mapped out this particular document I'm using to teach. So do you have any question? Okay. Benny, do you have any question? Okay. Good night, everyone. And um, thank you for joining this um, class for tonight. And I wish you a good rest tonight. See you tomorrow. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Charles. Good night, sir.